Hi everyone, I'm Crystal Berry from IDERA and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled MongoDB and JSON Data Modeling with Industry Influencer Steve Overman. This webcast will be recorded so you will be able to view it again and if you'd like, the recording will be available in our resource center on IDERA.com later this month. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the questions feature in the GoToWebinar control panel and we will try to answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. At this time, I will turn things over to Steve so he can get started. Steve? Great. Thank you, Crystal. Hi, everybody. So I'm Steve Hoberman. And actually, on this slide, you have my email address if you ever have any questions about the talk, even outside the talk, and also our web address. So you could see some of the books I've actually written I've written nine books on data modeling, including a book on MongoDB, which will relate to the topic we're going to talk about today. I've also been teaching data modeling. This year, we actually released the 10th edition of my data modeling manual, and I've been teaching data modeling. The first class I ever taught was back in 1992, so this is the 30th year I've been teaching data modeling, and we actually have public classes a couple times a year. We actually have one next week and we do on-site classes as well. And so let's get started talking about MongoDB and JSON data modeling. We're gonna cover three topics today, trends, challenges, and approach. For trends, we'll talk about four trends that we are seeing in the industry, and we'll use a fun case study as an example. And then we'll cover both tactical and strategic challenges that exist when modeling anything in NoSQL. In fact, you'll find that though specifically we're talking about MongoDB and JSON, a lot of what you'll hear today applies to how do you, mo how do you model NoSQL? So much more general and encompassing. And then we'll go through an approach to modeling NoSQL. I call it the align, refine, and design approach. It's kind of cool, it rhymes as well, so align, refine, and design. And we're gonna get started. And this is actually a picture of me. I, I actually took a picture with E.T. this past summer, and that's the original E.T. guy from the movie. So uh, there's a story behind that picture, but um, anyway, that, that will be for another presentation. So let's go through each of these. We'll start with the trends first. As Crystal mentioned too, whenever you have questions, feel free just to put the question in the, question area and then it will get asked and answered at the end of a talk. So let's start with trends. So I see four data modeling trends and these trends have been going on for a number of years and they continue to increase in my observation and my consulting assignments. I see these quite a bit. The first is a greater focus on data strategy which is a wonderful thing. The way it impacts us data modelers is sometimes when we work on an assignment, we might be asked to only produce the conceptual. So not travel through and do conceptual, logical, physical, but just have that conceptual as a picture of what are the key terms within our initiative and what do they mean? In fact, my last two consulting assignments were just building the conceptual. The organizations needed some visual that captured their common business language. And that's really what the conceptual does. It captures a common business language. So this is a strategy, that a trend that I see continuing for quite some time, hopefully for a long time. That's a little bit outside the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but that would make another great webinar for us to get back together on is talk about how the conceptual seems to be very tightly connected to data strategy, data governance. This is where we're going to spend some time, which a little bit more of on NoSQL. I don't know how many of you in your organizations are using NoSQL and modeling for NoSQL, but the trend is continuing. I was looking at an older presentation 
first time I think I talked about NoSQL was about eight or nine years ago. And a lot of what was talked about then is still true today, but it's just much more pervasive. It's used in many more organizations. And also in terms of exchanging data, a lot of organizations, a lot of industry bodies are agreeing that JSON is the standard. So instead of XML or other kinds of comma delimited files, we're using JSON in many situations. And there's more hybrid databases where we might be building a relational database, but there's also a requirement to store JSON, for example. So we might introduce, just like we would have a character or an integer format, we might have a JSON format, for example. So finding ways to combine the best of relational with the best of NoSQL, JSON. Okay. So these trends, it's interesting here, you see, I actually had my first experience with NoSQL when I was 12 years old, and in, in my sixth grade science project, I illustrated how you could organize baseball cards using IBM punch card technology. This was many years ago, so IBM punch card technology was still considered pretty cool. But the point is, I was able to organize information in a non-relational way. And that's really what NoSQL is. And so, building on these trends, there's an animal shelter that needs our help. They are being influenced to go more NoSQL. They're a small animal shelter. And today what they do is they get pets that are dropped off and they enter the pet information in a Microsoft Access database that they built themselves. And then once a week, they post pictures on their website directly from this Access database. When pets are adopted, they take them off the website. When new pets arrive, they're added to the website. And it's been working really well for them with the exception that there, there's a time lag. And also they have limited exposure. They can't really reach the area they would like to reach. And so what they decide to do is contact an, other animal shelters. And together, these animal shelters create an animal shelter consortium where they decide that they'll take data from their individual applications or databases and load them into a MongoDB database. And every so often, every day, they'll extract the data out of their databases and they will send them in JSON format to the MongoDB database. And so they have to kind of rethink how they see their world. It's no longer relational. Now they're dealing with a document database. And so we're going to help them. They're very comfortable on the relational side. And so they shared with us their relational conceptual data model. They have a pet. Each pet can be either a dog, a cat, or a bird. And then they have a number of characteristics around the pet. Information around breed, gender, vaccination. Adoption means their status. So is the pet ready for adoption? Have they been adopted? and also a number of images that they post on their website. So they have this world around the pet that they're capturing. They also, so the purpose of this conceptual for them was to get everybody in their animal shelter speaking the same language. When they use the term pet or vaccination, they all mean the same thing. They also built this logical model here, which Okay, there's a lot of boxes and words here, but it really is just a more detailed view of their conceptual. They added attributes. Before, a pet could be any number of breeds, but now we're also capturing what their primary breed is, for example. A pet could be many different colors, but they have a primary color. A pet can have many different images on the website, but there's one that they're gonna feature. And you'll notice too, Actually, what you'll notice the logical are two trends, two patterns. One pattern is the use of a lot of lookup entities, like gender and breed and vaccination. And the other is the use of 
many to many relationships. Really good ways to link two different concepts together where there's many on each side. A pet could have many breeds, a breed could be connected to many pets. And you see these two patterns here. The purpose of their logical was to capture their business requirements. They wanted to identify all the attributes they needed in their Microsoft Access database, and then they built their database. So this is very much your typical relational physical. Microsoft Access, so they did quite a bit of denormalization. They converted their many-to-many -many relationships into one-to-many. And you can see that here with breed and vaccination. They had to make some tough choices in denormalizing. When there was a lookup entity, like a code and a description, sometimes they just took the code in the case of gender. Sometimes they just took the description in the case of size. A lot of the attributes that were in other entities got denormalized into pet, as you see here. Instead of having multiple images, any number, we're allowed only three, and we're told that image path name one is where you'd put your featured image. So very much it works. It's sort of constrained based on the technology that we were using. But now they're looking at their world a little bit differently. They're looking at it more in terms of moving from relational to NoSQL. And they're facing a number of challenges. And if you were to group these challenges, they fit into two categories, tactical and strategic. Tactical means that we need to change our mindset a little bit. In the relational world, we're very comfortable organizing attributes into sets. Every attribute depends upon the key, the whole key and nothing but the key, so help me COD, remember that. It's all about normalization and organizing things. And when we're looking at it more in terms of NoSQL, it's really less about organizing the attributes according to their properties and more about organizing the attributes according to their queries, their access patterns, their usage. And that's a really big shift. We're going from thinking about, okay, what's the relationship between an order and a product to thinking, what's somebody going to do when they look at order and product information? How are they going to query this information? And a first step would be thinking more instead of one to many is in the nature of the data, thinking more in terms of, okay, what contains what? If we were to organize a hierarchy of data, how would it look? And so in ER Studio, it has the containment property you can add to the relationship right at your logical level. And then when you go to the physical level, thinking more about containment, you're saying, okay, so how would somebody want to query the data? Well, they're going to start with order first, and then they want to see the lines. And sometimes in the lines, they may want to see the product. So you see what the shift is, going from understanding what the data is to understanding how the data is used. So usage dictates the design, very strict. Of course, you can argue in the relational world, usage plays a very big role too, but we're not redesigning our world based on a query, where in NoSQL we are. And there's two ways to display this query world in ER Studio. One is you can actually display each entity with these arrows that indicate containment, or you can actually show what it would look like in one entity embedded, where order contains lines, lines contain products. Very much a hierarchy view of the world. Both of these you can display in ER Studio depending on your audience, what they would like to see. Developers may be more comfortable in looking at the world as it would be in a JSON structure. Maybe business analysts, state architects may, may like to see the attributes in separate entities like here. And then you convert right to JSON from these structures. Now, in terms of strategic challenges, we're looking at the world in terms of modeling for queries. So at a very high level, we have RDBMS, Relational Database Management Systems. That's your Microsoft Access, your Oracle, 
your SQL servers, any database that's storing things in sets. Okay. Where NoSQL is anything else. <laughs> NoSQL means really not a relational database. And this slide is a very important slide because what it shows is that we're very comfortable up here thinking about, okay, are we modeling for something operational like a new order entry system or a new application to enter pets or a subscription system or a trading system or a banking system, all operational, and we care about business rules in the operational world, and therefore we're gonna model relationally. Relationally is all about normalizing the attributes, making sure we have the right primary keys and foreign keys, or are we concerned about analytics, OLAP, in which case we're going to model we're using dimensional techniques. And that's been our choices. Either we're going operational, so we're going to go relationally, or we're going analytically, and therefore we're going to build a dimensional model. Now, the other option is, what if it's not relational or dimensional? What if our focus is on discovery? We have a data set, we don't know what's in it, or we have some queries that are very complex, in which case NoSQL becomes the option we use. Okay. So for example, for an RDBMS, we're gonna enforce rules. A customer must own at least one account. For a dimensional, we're gonna look at it in terms of analytics. How much did we make in fees by date, region, and product? And then once I know my answer, instead of a date, I wanna look at it by month and year. And then for query, we're going to look at it more in terms of what are the patterns in the data? What, what do we want to do with the data? Purely access pattern or query driven. So which customers own a checking account that generate over a certain amount in fees and, and anything else we want to know about these customers? Really important strategic shift going from understanding modeling the properties of a data to modeling how somebody uses the data. And this leads to a different approach, sort of different. The same steps exist, the same models, conceptual, logical, physical. I call the conceptual a business terms model, and that's what you see here. I also think that to accommodate both relational and NoSQL, instead of using the terms conceptual, logical, physical, we should make it more general and use the terms align, refine and design. I like those phrases, align, refine and design. Align means we're looking to understand the scope of the effort, make sure we're all speaking the same language. Refine is all about making sure we know the requirements, the queries, for example, in NoSQL. And design is all about making it real. So instantiating it, creating a schema, whether it's a, re a relational database schema for Oracle or a document schema for MongoDB. So remember these steps too. It's align, refine, design. Align's all about common terms. Refine is all about requirements. Design is all about making it work with your technology. Okay. And this is the approach we're going to go through. We're going to, our goal is still to create these deliverables, but they're going to look different in a NoSQL world. And the steps are going to be different. For align, well, how would you typically build a conceptual? How would you typically align in a relational world? You might do some brainstorming, who, what, when, where, why, or how, and ask questions like, what's the relationship between customer and account? Can a customer own more than one account? Can an account be owned by more than one customer? That thought process. In the NoSQL world, a lot of it comes down to understanding what's somebody going to do with the data. And a really good place to start is with user stories. Okay. A user story, introducing a stakeholder, what they want to do, and why. And then these high-level user stories can be broken down into queries. And then we can look at these queries and determine the sequence they will occur in, and that will help determine our model, what it will look like in the alignment stage, the refinement stage, and the design stage. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if we are focusing on user stories and we have this consortium of animal shelters, we might identify these three as being really important user stories. So, as a potential dog adopter, I want to find a particular breed or breed mix 
so that I can get the type of dog I'm looking for that's also good with my children, okay? And maybe there's one, somebody who likes to adopt birds. I don't, I've never adopted a bird, so I don't know, but I guess they would look to see if they find an exotic bird, like a parrot instead of a pigeon. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't know how many people adopt pigeons, but uh, an exotic bird, okay? And then the third user, user story would be as a potential cat adopter, I want to find a particular gender so that I can get the type of cat I'm looking for. And there might be a lot of other user stories too, but these fit nicely on a PowerPoint slide. So let's say these are our three user stories and what comes out of it are some queries. We can take the user stories and parse them, break them down and realize here we have five different queries. We have the first query, which is only show animals really that are ready for adoption, only show dogs with a certain breed, only show dogs that are good with children, only show exotic birds, only show uh, available cats by gender. So we're taking very much a query view, and then we can look at these queries and determine the order somebody might execute them in, where the first query is, no matter what kind of pet we're looking for, a dog, a cat, or a bird, we need just to filter to make sure we're only displaying those that are available for adoption. Then if somebody's looking for dogs, we can go this path up here, only display dogs that are good with children, and then let them filter by breed. If we're looking for birds, only show the exotic birds, hide your pigeons, for example. And if you're looking for cats, only show cats by a certain gender. So notice our focus here is very much on what somebody's gonna do, the queries. Some NoSQL databases use the term access patterns in terms of queries, but they mean the same thing. We're just talking about the query, what's somebody going to be doing in the data? And then the refinement stage, well, now we're going to do is we're going to take these queries, and just like the move from conceptual to logical, we're going to refine them. We're going to identify additional attributes that are really important. We're going to use our typical refinement techniques, elicitation techniques like interviewing, artifact analysis, prototyping, and so on, refine all the queries. And the end goal is a model that shows what all the attributes are and its sequence and the order that somebody is going to query. So for example, here, you think about our five queries. Notice right in the beginning, we're first listing the adoption status codes. So we can only display those pets that are available for adoption. And then underneath that, we have pet type. So we can filter by whether it's a dog, a cat, or a bird. And then underneath that, we have a set of characteristics. What's interesting is just like in the relational world, when we abstract, we abstract an employee into a role that a party's playing, for example. Here in a NoSQL world, we realize we have just a bunch of characteristics. Characteristics like breed, gender, all the entities that we had as decode entities with a code and description, we abstract it up here into characteristic. So we can quickly allow someone to filter and look at only female cats, only look at male dogs, for example. And then within there, have all the detailed information about the pet. Now, it's really interesting going back to that term patterns, how if you look at our logical, a relational logical model, you have one-to-many relationships and many-to-many -many relationships. A lot of those follow certain patterns when you're converting them into a hierarchy for a document database like MongoDB, for example. And you can see that here. The many-to-manys, for example, become a nested array here. So if Sparky's a dog and Sparky had three vaccinations, they would all be listed here. And Sparky is five different colors and his primary color is brown, so that would go here and there's, there's six images of Sparky. So what we're doing is we create a lot of arrays in the NoSQL world. We're taking our one-to-many relationships and sometimes our many-to-many -many, and we're creating these arrays. And then from a design perspective, this is where we add the secret sauce. So similar to when you go from a relational, logical to physical, 
you would start looking at things like, okay, I'm using Oracle. Oracle likes things a certain way. I'm using Teradata. Teradata likes things a certain way. And so you're doing the same thing here. You're looking at this, at this model, at this refinement model, this logical model, and you're saying, okay, we're using MongoDB. MongoDB has certain kinds of features. They have certain kinds of indexes. This is where you add the secret sauce, what each database has that's different from their competitors. So in the end, your design model looks a lot like your logical model, your refinement model, except it's added for all the bells and whistles, all the important features for that kind of database. So that is, these are our topics. We actually, uh, just to, the key points from the talk, the first is that a lot of times when you hear NoSQL, we think, oh, we can build a database really quick without going through proper modeling. And you can see that's not true. In fact, what happens is NoSQL even means we have more modeling. Not only do we need to model to correctly understand what the queries are, but that relational logical model still holds an incredible amount of value because you can imagine you have all these use cases and they could all tie to the same relational logical model. That relational logical model has the primary keys, which are still important, the foreign keys, the nature of the attributes, and all of that feeds very nicely into this NoSQL modeling of queries. So modeling becomes even more important. Now it's even more important whether organizations choose to model is up to them, but I, I will share with you that if we don't model correctly in the beginning, we'll need to fix things later on, and it's always more expensive to fix things later on. And also, you have MongoDB and JSON modeling are actually very similar to each other because they have the same basic structure of looking at the world as a hierarchy. I remember when I was first modeling relationally back in 1990, a lot of the people I worked with had very much a hierarchy view of the world. They were very comfortable with technologies like vSAM, and it was a shift for them to go from vSAM to relational. And now there's a shift to go back. <laughs> MongoDB and JSON are, are actually kind of similar to the 1960s view of looking at things in terms of a hierarchy. And it's just another mind shift to go back to that. Okay. The difference is with JSON, we are just looking at one structure, no matter what, one file going across between systems. With MongoDB, you might have one file, one structure representing your application, but you could also have more. You could have MongoDB is known for supporting multiple structures, not just one. You can have references between the structures. No matter what, there's always a need for the three levels. They really have withstood the test of time. And you can call it anything you like. You can call the conceptual, the alignment level, the logical refine, the physical design. I came up with these names, align, refine, design, because I know that developers can squirm in their seats when I say conceptual, logical, physical, no SQL developers. And so I found that if I just come up with a different term that captures what it is, it seems to work better. And it's been going well so far. So you can use these terms too. Align is all about coming up with your common language, your, your scope. Refine is all about understanding the queries that are being that are needed to be run, the access patterns. And design is all about coming up with that secret sauce, what's unique about Mongo or DynamoDB and so on. Remember too, OLTP, when you're dealing with transactional systems, it's relational. OLAP, analytical, it's dimensional. And NoSQL, it's query. It's really looking at the query. Okay. And that is my talk. So we have time for Questions, if anybody has any questions. Great, I think we have a few questions uh, here for you, Steve. And the first one is um, from Dave. He asked, I thought that CDM and LDM are independent of the solution of the business data. Therefore, CDM and LDM seem to still appropriate 
seem to still appropriate, but you then have to select physical representation. <laughs> it, sorry about that. Is that still true? It's definitely still true. Thank you for the question. It's definitely still true. So the conceptual and logical are still independent of the technology. The difference is though, when you're focusing on a query, you're looking at the order of the query. So here, for example, this model here is actually independent of technology. All it's capturing is what is the path somebody is going to take when they're getting answers to their queries. If I wanted to, just like on the relational side, we're capturing the nature of the attributes. On the NoSQL side, we're capturing the nature of the query. So this might look very much like a MongoDB collection, for example, but really what it's showing is the sequence somebody would go through when they answer the questions, independent of technology. Yeah. It's a great question, thank you. Thanks, Steve. Uh, the next question is from Raymond. Uh, he said, great info. Uh, will you address the distinction between query data perspective, JSON, but then how to land the data in a rational DB, relational DB? Uh, going from, uh, can you ask that one more time, please? I'm sorry, just a, sure. just a lot. Of... Will you address the distinction between query data perspective, JSON, but then how to land the data into a relational DB? How to, how to land it into, okay. So how to go from the modeling steps that we went through here, the align refine design steps, and eventually take that data and load it into a relational database. Um, that's interesting. I wonder, so, so once you create your models using this step and thinking more in terms of the access pattern, going to the relational side um, would probably look more like, and actually it probably would look quite a bit like this model here, where we're organizing the entities and the attributes according to containment. That was actually my education when I was thinking about making the shift. And I'm not sure if this answers the questions. If it doesn't, Raymond, please let me know. But making the shift thinking um, more about containment than one to many's and many to many's um, that was the big change for me was structuring the model according to um, what entity contains what other entity instead of just having these independent entities that relate to each other and sometimes you are repeating the same content multiple times once for each query if we're looking at things at a product level first in this example, you would start with product. Product would contain orders and order line, for example. But if you're looking at orders first, you'd start with order and then order contains lines and product. So I'm not sure if that answers the question. If not, please, please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next question is from Amrish. Do we suppose to have most commonly used search criteria element listed up front in the beginning when designing JSON? Yes, so the most common, it actually would be the starting point. So for example, we would say, actually this is a good one here for that. We would say, um, what query would most people start with? And even though it may not be the most common, but if our first query is, I only want to show pets available for adoption, that would appear first, okay? So instead of looking at it from starting with the most common, if we can look at it by starting with the sequence first, where would you start first? And sometimes you'll have multiple models. Um, I cringe when I think about data redundancy and I always remember in the relational world, denormalization is something you don't you want to do as a last resort. But in NoSQL, we might have several different variations of the entity you see here. You might start off by saying, I only want to see animals ready for adoption. So that would be one model. And maybe there's another set of use cases 
where I only want to see vaccinated animals first, and then I want to look at dogs and cats, and that would be a completely different model. Yeah, thank you. All right, great. The next question is from Larry, and he asked, what happens when later on you have to run queries that you didn't take into account when designing? Yeah, that's, I can tell that person has architect in their title, and that's exactly, yeah, so very important point. What you What you need to do then is you either revise your structure, it goes in a different way, or you find ways to get creative with the attributes. For example, here we put characteristic as a level. Characteristic did not exist in our original model. We abstracted all the different codes to a higher level. So it gives us a layer of flexibility. If somebody wants to look at pets by breed or by gender, it's easy for them to do. So part of the answer to the question is you could abstract and that gives you a layer of flexibility. The other part of the answer is maybe we could look at our queries and even though they are very specific to certain use cases, maybe we could make these more generic too. For example, instead of having only show dogs that are good with children, maybe it's only show pets that are good with families, for example. So the second part of the answer is we might be able to make the queries more generic to handle other kinds of other kinds of queries that come up in the future. The problem though, and you bring this up, is that it's not a very flexible structure. It's great for certain queries, but not for all of them. And that's something we might have to adjust over time. Yeah. It's also one of the reasons why the relational model is so powerful because it doesn't constrain by query. Um, it, it's all about the properties of the data and how it relates to other properties. So, yeah, thank you. Thanks for that question. All right, the next question is from Kevin, who asks, how do we add a new pet in this model, i.e., where the list of vaccination come from in this model? Yeah, how do we, so how would we add a new pet here? It would have to go, so it's going to be first entered in whatever application the animal shelter is using. So in this case, it would still get entered through access. It would come across in JSON and it would have some kind of code. This is a new pet that's ready for adoption. And then it would be stored in this structure here where a developer, some kind of mapping would say, okay, Sparky's a new dog. We just entered him in today. Here are his vaccinations, here are his colors. And it would have to store it, it would have to map it from the relational model to the JSON file coming across. And then that JSON file will look very much like the end result in MongoDB. So, so so it would pretty much transform from relational to the hierarchy that new pet would just be repeated so for example every, if the new pet is a male and it is a um it is a german shepherd for example that pet information would be repeated in here twice once for the characteristic male once for the characteristic um german shepherd breed Thank you. Thanks for that question. The next question is from Michael, who asks, how does one model relational integrity? I find that preventing orphan records is difficult with NoSQL. You're absolutely right. And you usually don't. You usually don't. It's another reason why the data should be stored in a relational way somewhere, because that relational database will enforce the rules the logical relational model will show us what those rules are. But the NoSQL, it's not really designed for that. A lot of the vendors have features where you could code or add certain things to help enforce it, but that's not its purpose. 
So you, you lose there. As long as you have some database that actually does enforce the rules somewhere, we should be okay. But you're right, it's not designed for that sort of thing. The next question is from Don. He asks, can you discuss issues around transactions with regard to NoSQL? For example, applying updates when something changes about a pet. Yes. So if you look at the different kinds of NoSQL databases, document, key value, graph, and column, those are the four main kinds. They're, each database is like each type of database is like a tool, like a hammer or a screwdriver, and some are better for updates than others. MongoDB, document databases in general, work best when there's not there aren't updates to individual transactions where you're storing and retrieving highly related content like information about a pet it's not really designed to handle when you have a lot of changes to the data column databases also are not designed for that key value databases like DynamoDB are designed for handling changes very well so if you're working in coming back here, you would still follow these steps that we're going through here. But when you get to the, the design step, you would look at it and say, wait a minute, we have an issue. We have a lot of transactions and there are updates to transactions. And so maybe MongoDB may not be the database of choice. Maybe we should choose DynamoDB, which is a key value database. Our logical model, the refinement model will still look the same, but the design model will look very different. We'll start adding certain features for a key value database, for example. Thank you for that question. All right, the next question comes from Suji. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Is it better to separate the data into different collections based on a unique key or embed them into a single co consolidated document with the same collection? So at a, these are excellent questions. At a refinement level, it's better, it's better to view it in one document because it forces us to think about what queries are gonna be asked and what are the dependencies among those queries. When you get to the design and you're thinking more about the database, it really depends. Just like if you were to ask the question, is it better to denormalize when you get to the physical, I would answer the same way. It really depends. Are you using Microsoft Access or are you using Teradata? So when you get to that design stage, it depends on your specific database. MongoDB works, has the features to store everything in one structure or to have multiple collections that reference each other. Okay. I spent my last consulting assignment working a lot with DynamoDB and DynamoDB likes to see everything in one structure. So the short answer to your question is your typical consulting answer is it really depends. I will say that your refinement model would look the same either way. And we should strive to have it all in one structure because it shows our thought process in answering the queries. The design model would depend on your technology. Key value would all be in one structure. Document databases like MongoDB, maybe, maybe one structure, maybe several, depending on whether the earlier question, whether you're doing updates to the data or how the data is being used. Thank you. All right, and this next question is from Steve, who asks, what happens when you have a second or third order of the query? Do you have more than one structure and a repeat of the data stored? You do, yeah, you do. Now, if in this case, we made certain attributes more generic, like in characteristic, we abstracted breed and gender. So if there was a query that said, I wanna see all the German shepherds, or I wanna see all the male cats, the same structure should work fine. But if there was a different order to these, attributes. For example, if somebody wanted to, I only want to look at pets that have a flu vaccine. I don't know if pets get a flu vaccine. I don't think they do, but just as an example, I only want to see pets that get a flu vaccine. That would be a different structure because then we would have 
instead of having adoption code and name first, we would have vaccination information first and then embed everything within vaccination. Thank you. All right, the next question is from Anders and the question is, what to do when the number of potential queries grows and they cannot fit into one JSON structure? Yeah, yeah, so now, so that's more of a design type of question. When do we, when do we reach some kind of limit with our technology? Okay. So this is where there's gonna be a meeting between the data modeler slash data architect and the developer who knows the technology well. Just like in the relational side, there were convers there's conversations about, should we put this all in one table? Where do we partition? Where do we add indexing? We still have to have that same conversation on the NoSQL side. If we think that this document's getting too big and we have to break it up, that would be a conversation between the data people and the people who really know the technology intimately and decide the best way to structure it. So the short answer to your question is it depends. <laughs> Thank you. Gary asked, my experience, the Mongo is it's a large targeted source from relational data. It's created for data retrieval only. Is it typical that NoSQL is a source for relational? Oh, that's interesting. So going the other way around, normally we think of the relational databases, they enforce all the rules and then it goes to NoSQL. Does it ever go the other way around from NoSQL to relational? I have not worked in a project like that, but where I can see it happening is when your starting point is a data set that we have no idea what's hiding in it. So for example, a lot of organizations that use graph databases will start with a data set and we have no idea what's in it. No, we, don't, we don't know what patterns exist. And the graph database will identify the subset, maybe 1%, 3% of the data that's useful. And then that eventually might work its way into something relational where we're enforcing the rules. So I can see that happening. I can see it happening more when we're doing a lot of data mining kind of work where we're sifting through a large amount of data using NoSQL databases and then taking a small subset and that small subset might find its way into a data lake or something else that may be more relational or pseudo-relational. Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, David would like for you to go more into how data is stored in MongoDB and ask if it's just a collection of JSON files. It's a collection of, so MongoDB stores data in JSON. It's actually more specifically uh, BSON, which is JSON with some additional features in it. Um, so the question is to go more detail into how MongoDB would store the data. Was that the question? Right. How how does Mongo store the data? Yeah. So it would it, it, ideally it would look like. So I can speak from a modeling perspective because that's kind of my whole world. And from a MongoDB perspective, I would go down into a level like you see here on this slide, and then. I would turn it over to the MongoDB developers who would take this and make it real in the database. It would be stored in files. MongoDB has collections and documents, just like we have on the relational side, entities and instances. So that's the correspondent. But I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be the best person to talk about how it's stored that would again probably go back to having me sit down with somebody who's a MongoDB developer and how to translate this to a MongoDB database. Important question though, needs to be done. All right, Sandeep asks, have you ever run into any use cases where a NoSQL database is being used to implement a dimensional model? Yes. So the only case with that, and it's not a document database like MongoDB, it's more of a column database. So I don't know how many of us use column databases, 
but column databases are very, they lend themselves very well to doing analytics. And so one pattern that I've seen is building your dimensional models. And when you build your dimensional logical model, the refinement model, from that point, it gets converted to a column database. And that pattern actually existed for a really long time. In the 1980s, I don't know if you guys remember Sybase IQ, 1990s too, but that's what a lot of financial companies were using Sybase IQ for, which is a column database. They would actually do all their modeling and then the equivalent dimensional modeling and then have Sybase IQ do all the analytics on it. Yeah. So column databases is where you would see that sort of stuff happening. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Edwin asks, do you see data warehousing and analytics moving to NoSQL away from relational databases? How would a NoSQL model uh, for warehousing look? Yeah, wow. We can, this is wonderful. We should, if we were all in the same room together, this would be, you know, this is where we bring lunch in. And, mm -hmm. So I do not, my opinion, I do not see a data warehouse. Um, ever becoming NoSQL. I know it's a very strong statement, but the reason is I see NoSQL being extremely useful when you know your queries and you're driving it by queries. And a data warehouse really is kind of, it's kind of giving you everything, right? Your data warehouse is kind of like your supermarket. It has all the food there, but we don't know exactly what we're going to make. The NoSQL, you're already going in there thinking, I'm going to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, or I'm going to make some spaghetti. Uh, you can tell I'm not a cook at all either. Those are my two uh, staples there. But but NoSQL already assumes a certain way of looking at the data. And a data warehouse is your lowest common denominator, all your ingredients, all your building blocks. And relational is actually the best way to store all that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Really amazing questions. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, David asked, how are queries against a MongoDB structured? Can you show us such a query? Yeah, so this also is that line between Steve the data modeler and somebody else who's a MongoDB developer. Um, I can take the modeling down to a level like this, and I could even talk to a MongoDB developer and say, okay, what secret sauce needs to get added here from MongoDB? But that's where my skill set ends. And I think that's okay. I actually think that us data modelers are responsible for identifying the queries, structuring them, but we do not need to know exactly what the more technical, like a DBA, a developer, is going to do once they receive our model, how they represent it. So I wish I could show that, but that really is something I don't know. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Ravi asked if there's any sets of rules we can come up with. So in my MongoDB book, I have actually a set of rules on how to go from the logical model to the physical model. And MongoDB, the company, actually uses that book in, at least the last time I talked to their lead trainer, they use that book in their training that they do with clients and internally. So the logic would be, well, if you if you have, there's two ways to answer that question. One way is you could look at the kinds of relationships we have. Is it one to many? And is it identifying one to many or non-identifying one to many? Is it many to many? Understanding what the relationships are and then making a good guess what the document should be. That's one approach. The problem with that approach, though, is we're not taking into account the query. What's somebody going to do with the data? The other approach is completely forget the model for a minute and just focus on the queries. And once you understand the queries and their order, <clears throat> structure the model for that purpose, like you see here. And I actually think that's a better approach. Based on your comments, though, you can see the problems, right? It's not perfect. We might have the same data stored in multiple times. Somebody brought up earlier, what if we change the structure, change the data, we might have to rework some of our models. But I actually think that's a better approach. 
<clears throat> All right, Nicholas asked, given that JSON can be used by programming languages in a more natural way, does this capability influence the data JSON model? Does this, can you say that one more time, please? I'm sorry, Crystal, can you ask that one more time? I'm sorry, you might be on mute. Yes, he wanted to know if if that, if if the way JSON speaks in it to program languages, if that affects the, the data model. Ah, <clears throat> so that again would be at your design stage. Your refine stage, you would not make it specific for any kind of technology like JSON or Mongo. The design stage is where you would start thinking, okay, how would it look specifically for JSON or specifically for any NoSQL database like MongoDB? Great. All right, we will um, do one last question and um, then uh, we'll wrap up the webinar and any remaining questions that have yet to be answered, uh, we will get to Steve after the event and he can answer those um, for you guys. So the final question is, how do we enforce unique constraints, primary key and indexing? Yeah, so in NoSQL, the short answer to the question is really you don't actually, you don't. I mean, it, there are tools out there to enforce each, when you get to the secret sauce, each kind of databases, database has their own um, techniques for primary keys, Though primary key has a different role in NoSQL and relationships, the relationships mean something different in NoSQL. So the short answer is you do all that in some relational database and you hope when you move to NoSQL that it all remains intact. Yeah, yeah, it's not designed. If you were to think of each of these NoSQL databases as different tools, some tools are designed for integrity and that's the relational database, but some tools are designed for scalability and um, response time and, and storing amazing amounts of data in, a, in an efficient way. And th that's really the different kinds of NoSQL databases. Yeah. So thank you. These are great questions. Thank you so much for the questions. Yeah. Yes, thank everyone for joining us today. We are all out of time. I would like to thank Steve for his great presentation. This webcast has been recorded and the recording will be available for viewing uh, this month in the idera.com resource center. We appreciate everyone's time today and look forward to seeing you on our next event. Thank you.